Praise the Lord. Glad you're here today. How many are glad to be here today? Good for you. Glad, glad to gather. Um, we're family in the Lord. Some of us are real family, but, you know, I mean, some of us are brothers and sisters and sister-in-law. Thank you. you know, we're family. Um, I said earlier, if you weren't here, those who pray together, play together, stay together. And there's really something to be said. Um, God and family are the most important parts of life. You agree with me with that? Or God, your God, and the family, your family. Your family is important to God. Your kids, their kids, and their kids. God set it up so that we would have family. The enemy has tried to stop God's plan and is still trying to hinder God's plan, destroy God's plan, confuse people with uh, that what God's plan is. We are in a struggle. But keep praying and keep believing and keep living to the standards in which God himself established. God is not going to change his word. He'll never change his word. It's always, it will always be, it will last forever. And so we've been looking at the book of Ephesians for a couple of Sundays now. We are looking at what Paul wrote to encourage the church family, the people of God, the body of Christ. And Paul is writing this, we know that he was in prison while well, he wrote this, yet he focused on others other than himself. He looked beyond his circumstances and he began to focus on other people that he loved, that he knew, that he cherished, that God helped him to uh, reach. Paul's desire after he was converted he was a changed man. He was a total jerk before. Amen. If I can use that word. It's a total, um, just on the opposite with God, on the opposite, not understanding. And Paul writes, and we read it, the second chapter, we read about that prior to conversion. Paul writes this, and I'm just, and just kind of preluding some of this, catching us up here before we get to chapter 3. But Paul writes, says, we were, you were dead. You were dead. You were dead in your sins and trespasses in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. How many know there's a world, there's a course that the world is on? The world is on a course that is not good. The world has a system that is destruct, destroying and, and very destructive because it is controlled without God. There is no control. There is no self-control. There's just all live for yourself, whatever it takes, as long as it's for me, is good. That's the world. That's the system. There's a much of, much of what we're sensing today is very anti-God or anti-Christ, a spirit of anti-Christ. But we're not going to be afraid of that because greater is he that is in you. You know what? The, the, the enemy is afraid. He gets afraid when he knows the church is praying. He gets bothered when the people of God are praising him, praising the Lord, because he knows that's where your strength is, and he wants to take that if he can. He wants to steal that, that your heart. He wants to steal your song if he can. But let's not let him do that. We're going to sing, we're going to praise, we're going to believe God. Uh, reading through the Old Testament, as I do, I plow through. I, I don't always get a lot out of the First and Second Chronicles, you know. It's just a lot of names, and I plow through it. And, you know, I'm reading along there, and it says something about uh, that David had organized a band. He had organized the musicians. And there are some really weird names yeah, I wouldn't probably ever name my kid something like Jephahud, Ainahad. You know, these are 
These, were, these are not names we name our kids today. Asaph, that's not bad. Asaph was a musician. He was a leader. And David arranged. David was a musician. King David loved to, loved to worship God, even as a young boy. He learned to play the harp. And he probably learned to play the mandolin, too, if he had one. But he had stringed instruments. Stringed instruments. He had also, he used brass. He, he used trumpets. He used cymbals. Symbols, my word, symbols in the church. Oh, and what I'm reading along, and it said they would, they would assign them, and they would start up. They were skillful. They were gifted. And God was using them to establish the praise in the body of Christ. How many know when you begin to praise God, things begin to look differently? You begin to feel differently because you're beginning to think about where God is and who God is. And rather than looking at the circumstances of the world, we'll go really, we really get depressed, don't we? If we only look at what's going on in the world, let's get our eyes on Jesus. So Paul is writing to the church, you were dead. What happened? What is he doing? He's encouraging. You were just like the rest of them. But God, remember we said, but God being rich. Because God intervened. He raised us up. He brought you out of the miry clay, so to speak. He brought you out of the mully grubs. The enemy's clutches could no longer hold you down. You saw the light. You, you sensed Jesus came into your heart. And he made the difference. And now you have reason to live and have your being. You have reason to get out of bed in the morning because you have been given another day to walk with God. Think about that. You ever think about that? You get to walk with God. God wants to walk with you. You and I together. God is walking with you. That was his plan in the original. Adam and Eve were in the garden. It was perfect. God would come down and walk with them at the beginning. That was God's plan. And it still is in the heart of God to walk with his people. But we must focus on, we must hear. We must listen. We must try to hear what he's saying, and his best way to hear is to read. That's the best way. Other than, you know, I find these songs that we're singing get in my heart. I don't know about you. I'll be going to work, and boom, 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 boom. The wall of songs are, are going through my head. Are you that way? I guess that's a good thing. It helps us keep our focus. God knows what he's doing. He knows what we need to keep our focus. And so God is raising up this whole body of Christ, this whole building. We read a little bit about how we are being fitted together in, in the latter part of chapter 2. The whole building, the whole fellowship, is, we're like growing into a holy temple in the Lord. You know, Solomon built a magnificent building. You read about it. So much gold went into that place. Overlaid boards, overlaid with gold, 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 and then a little bronze beside silver. But you know what he said? Solomon said, I can't build a house that will hold you. I can't build it. Big enough, good enough. But God wasn't concerned so much about the gold and silver as he was concerned about the people's heart because he knows what's, what, what real worship is. He, he knows what true believers are. He knows when you're genuine. He knows when you're sincere. He knows when you mean what you pray. And I believe... 
as the Lord settled in upon Solomon as he prayed that temple, the cloud filled that place so heavily. It said that the ministers, those who were the priests, couldn't stay on their feet. They had to fall before him. The presence, in his presence. The psalmist said, in his presence is the fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures. In his presence, you learn nothing else. All we really need is him, his, his presence. So now by the time we get to the third chapter, he mentions a little bit about this mystery. I mentioned a little bit about it last week, a mystery. What is this mystery all about? Well, the mystery is this. Paul had a revelation. And we know that the Bible in the Old Testament, God chose Israel. God chose Israel to be his people. That will never change. But the mystery, the, the thing that the Old Testament people didn't understand was that they'd never seen any other people that would become joint heirs with them. And what Paul is teaching here, not only is Israel chosen, but I have chosen whosoever will. So you and I become brother and sister with, with all, all of God's people together. We are joint heirs together. There is no respecter of people. There's no partiality. God doesn't say, well, I love this one so much. Oh, he's my favorite. It doesn't, it doesn't, God is not impressed how you look, except your heart. I, I know, I mean, look, do your best, look your best. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to get in trouble. I had to clip some hair here today, so I was, you know, feeling terrible. I'm back there, you know, because I learned it from Derek. He said he cuts his own hair. So. I'm sorry, Derek. You look great. Anyway, oh, boy. God is caring about every part of your life. God cares What's bothering you? Talk to him about it. Talk to him about it. When you feel like you can't take another day, this is, when you feel like you can't, you don't know what you're going to say to some person. When you feel you reached your end, there are a whole lot of brothers and sisters in the, in the, in the cross, the community and around the world. There are a whole lot of brothers and sisters that are paying the price for their faith. Unbelievably persecuted. But God still builds and builds and keeps building. Even if the church has tried to, you know, the, the world has tried to stop, tear down the church. Jesus said even the gates of hell shall not prevail against. I believe that God is still raising up young people. I, I watched, uh, and I watch occasionally my, where my girls are at Florida, down in Florida in Southeastern College, and they have these worship periods. And you talk about their, their culture, that culture. God is doing some great things in the young people. We're going to see great and mighty things. God is raising up voices. God is raising up worship leaders. God is raising up proclaimers and people who will preach and live and demonstrate the love of God around the world. <clears throat> Ephesians reminds us, look at these verses Verse 3, by that revelation that was made known to me, the mystery as I wrote before in brief. And by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight. Someone needs to get me a little cup of water, please. My throat is... <coughs> get that. You ever get those tickle coughs? 
Yeah, that's the time of year. Anyway, I'll get there. Which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men? Other generations did not get this revelation, this mystery. Now he said, to be, to, to be specific. Don't you like it when God says, specifically? It's like you want to say, well, God, can you just say that one more time in a different way? Thanks, man. Your reward will be in heaven, Joe. <laughs> it's out of this world. So, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, and fellow members of the body. That's us. That's you and I. <clears throat> Partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. What is the gospel? Good news. Jesus came to save us. Jesus came to save the sinner. The lost will be found. The outcasts, those who can't, you can't go to the temple because you're not of the, you're not of Israel. Well, God says, no. You're mine. You're not, you, you also don't care what you're, what you label, what, what blood's in you. Every tribe, every tongue. We're, we're invited because of the blood of Jesus. It covers whosoever will. And so we read on. Paul. We would consider Paul a giant. Now, by this time, he would be a giant in the church. Look how he looks, look how he sees himself, verse 8. To me, the very least of all saints. He doesn't have an ego problem. He doesn't have, he's not stuck on himself. He's not trying to impress people. Or, he says, to me, the very least, I really feel that Paul understood how much he was saved from. <clears throat> being what he was before conversion. By the grace of God, he was saved. It was the act of God. It was the mercy of God that confronted Paul. And he was awakened. And we read on this mystery. So the scriptures that Paul wrote was also God breathe is also scripture that we read as Second Timothy says all scripture, all scripture, not part of it, not this part and not the other, but all scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, 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 and training. Training. Some of you guys were in military. I know you guys. Some of you guys were in military. I never had that privilege. I really was glad I didn't have that privilege. <clears throat> but I understand you learn discipline. You learn to take commands. You are trained. You are trained by others. Because when there's war, there's a need to follow commands. And so, now I want to liken this Paul. Paul, he, he referred to the believers also in one place, 
that we are soldiers, soldiers for him. In other words, we are not in charge. Someone else gives the command. And so when we become a father of Christ, I am no longer in charge of my life. I am only going to respond under his command. I am going to do what he's called me to do or be. Because he's in charge. And he knows the battle that is going on. He knows the strategy that will win. He knows that which will take the enemy and that will push back the strongholds. And the army was, got really big. It's been getting bigger every day in the house of the Lord. The people come. People reach an age where they go on to the reward. And God needs to keep replenishing. And this cycle keeps on going. As long as we're on this earth, there will always be a battle. As long as we are on this you know, I would just love to have an easy life. I just always wanted to have an easy, you know, live in a little log cabin, not be bothered by anybody else, just kind of live in peace, right? You've had that dream too, haven't you? Come on. Something like that. Not have to worry about, you know, just people and their struggles, but God didn't. I don't see in scripture where that's really scriptural. I think the closest I kind of came to it was John the Baptist. He lived in the wilderness. But that was all preparation for his public ministry. (laughs) You eventually have to come out sometime. You have to come out of the woods. Jackie will like that one. You got to come out of the woods someday because God knows the needs. They're people's. But the good thing about being in the woods or being alone or being with, with the Lord is that you replenish, you renew. You renew. We ought to renew ourselves. Renew our strength, O oh Lord. That's why I like winter, I think. I think that's part of it. It's, it's, it's a slower. It's slower. I get more time to reflect. So God is not, he doesn't expect us to um, burn out for him. He wants us to burn with him, burn bright, but not burn out. So you have to know when to say no, and there's enough is enough, and we, we all try to figure that out. And God is so, 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 in, so engaged. He's such a God of order. You just think how the just whole creation is. And so God, Paul is describing, we have been <clears throat> given this understanding that we're going to dwell together with the people of Israel, that we are one in the spirit. But Paul gets to verse 13 and he says, now, wait a minute, don't get down on my behalf. In other words, he's thinking about people, what they're thinking about him in prison. Look at verse 13. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulation. I've said this before, what stops many people in their assignments, in their calling, in their ministry, is discouragement. Because we all need encouragement ourselves. How many many would agree? Yes, yes. You see, we all get to a point, well, we... A lot, of, a lot of you feel like you're spent already, probably. You're spent. And that's okay, but 
if we're spent, how can we, how can we give anything? How can we have anything to say if we're spent, if we're discouraged? And the enemy knows exactly what to, to do to di- get you discouraged, doesn't, doesn't he? He knows how to push your buttons. That, that's a phrase we, you know, knows how to push, what, what tips you over. And so we say, Lord, oh, it's not going to be just easy rolling, you know. It's not going to just, I'll never have any breakdowns, you know. I'll just, everything will run smoothly. Everything's going to go like clockwork. We can count on it. You know, just, we don't know about the economy. We don't know about what's going to, you know, we just don't have all the, you know, the what ifs. We really can't say, this is for sure. James, that little wonderful little book of James says it right there. Don't be so sure. If you say we're going to go to a city and we're going to make a profit, we're going to we're going to rake, rake it in. But he says, you don't know what your life will be like tomorrow. You could be gone. Your life is like a vapor. In other words, what he's saying, God, <clears throat> with God's help, if it's God's will. And this is what I believe our secret of rising above circumstances is just to walk and to live in the perfect will of God. And how do we do that? We have to keep sitting at his feet. We have to keep going back and taking the instruction, the correction from the word of God. So God, number one, he has a plan. He has revealed to us his plan through Christ that we might walk in him and he has saved us for the reason that we are not going to just live for ourselves. We read before in Ephesians 2 we were not saved by works but rather we are saved and then works ought to follow. Good living, good workmanship putting your heart into what you do as the scripture says do it with all your heart with all your soul what sort of your hand find to do i think god enjoys watching his children create make things find things and get get a vision for making some i think the lord really enjoys seeing his children having something they enjoy doing. I don't know. What do you think? I think he does. He loves to be involved. He's gifted you. He's put interest in your heart and your mind. God is always working. God is always working. God is always at work in you so he can do a work through you. Does that one click? Does that one stick? God is working in you. God is stirring, talking to you so that you will be a vessel. My goodness. Got awfully quiet in here. Yeah. God is for you. You know, let's not be afraid to get beat up by God. He doesn't do that. He doesn't beat us up encourages us, instructs us, he disciplines us. You know, the greatest gift God has given to us is to the will to want to learn more about him. The will, the desire, the want to. If the want to is broken in me, I can't fool God. If I'm having a day where I'm struggling to pray or praise or be thankful, 
or I went back to a, uh, another stage of life and what we, we understand went back to your younger self and maybe your younger self was not where it ought to have been and so you begin to drift back. That's life. What, <clears throat> what I encourage you to do if that happens is to come just as honestly and open back to the Lord, just, just as honest as you can be. God knows your heart anyway, and when you confess your faults and your needs, that just says, the Lord just says, yes, yeah, just exactly what I needed. And now I can move. Now I can come. Now I can be an encouragement. So Philippians 2, 12 and 13 says this, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Paul is writing to the Philippians in another place, another time. And what Paul's, one of his concerns was, was when I leave, when I leave the teaching to others, he was a little bit nervous at times. He had to trust God. He was always concerned that wolves would come in. False teachers would come and confuse the people and turn on the people and get the people to fall away. But Paul had to learn to trust in the Lord God. And I liken that too. When your, your kids get to be older, well, you get to be older and they get their permit, and they want to drive, and you got to let go, and then you got to let go, and you can be there. And someone said this, this was very powerful at a men's advance. They said we go from being caring for our, our children to caring about them. All of a sudden, they leave home, Mom and dad is not there. They're going to live. They're going to do. We have to trust them. Even though they make mistakes, we're there to encourage them. And sometimes we just have to let, let go. And it's hard. It's hard. But on the other hand, it's not so bad. It's a nesty, nesting, uh, just empty nesting thing. Oh, we're starting to enjoy this. Oh, my goodness. It's quiet around here, isn't it? My, 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 we don't have to think so hard anymore. Yeah. Okay, well, it's time for you to go now. You know, it's good to see you. We're glad you're doing well. <sighs> you think about it. You started out with nothing. Think about this. Can you think back a little bit? You started out when you were young, dreams and aspirations and hopes, things that were, wow, this is, we're going to do this forever. You know, this was, this is the way it was going to be. Wow. Life settles in. Life gets busy. It's all good. But God is saying, wait a minute, no, come on, come out here. We need time. We need time. We need to huddle. We need to come in. You need to come in. I need to speak some things to you. I need to correct some, you know, I'm going to encourage you in this. How many have had people, well, let me say it this way. There are people in the church, in the fellowship, that are really good at encouraging people. And then there are other people that maybe that's not their gift. <laughs> Where I'm going with this is if we could be, if you would be, want to be corrected by someone with had the gift of encouragement or didn't have the gift, which one would you pick? The one with had the gift would say to you, well, by the time it was all said and done, they would have you happy. They would somehow have you encouraged knowing that you did a dumb thing. Uh, yeah. 
Because if someone just beats us up and says, says some horrible things, I've had, uh, I've known people who've had their parents say to them some hard things to them. You'd be like, you'll never amount to anything. That's like one of the worst things. God is saying to you, you're going to amount to something. You're going to become someone in me. I have great plans because, and you read the final parts of these verses, God is, he's not a cheapskate. He's not broke. He says it, Paul says that he is able. <clears throat> Look at it, verse 20, we'll conclude. Now to him, he wraps it up with this, in this chapter. Now to him who is able. Right there, we can think about that for a moment. Now to him who is able. With God, all things are possible. To do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. Let's, let's just camp on that verse. At the close, this, uh, we've got a, Ethan's coming back for a moment or something. But let's camp on that for a moment. He is able. Not my ability. Not what I can do for Christ. But what Christ can do through you and I. Oh, Philippians says, oh, all, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things. And I don't believe that we're meant to do everything. That's not the way the body works. But the particular stage of life that you're in right now, the particular season of life that you're in right now, I believe that's where we need something for us now, right now, where you're, what you're going through, right? The stage of life that you're in. You need something fresh from the Lord. And I'm here to say that the Word of God is, has something fresh for you in your stage of life because he says it, not me, that if we can't think, we can't even ask what we ought to ask because he goes beyond. He's able. And so... Sometimes I don't, I don't, I, the hardest thing for me to do is ask, ask for help. Why is that so hard? Because it's pride. It's pride. It's Norwegian pride. Come on, Ben Ladders, you, yeah, you might have a little too. We're all self made, tough. Grit. David showed emotion. David, King David. He was a fighter. He was like a rooster in his youth. He wasn't, he was humble about it. He was good at what he did and he didn't even know it. He never flaunted himself. Because he knew where his strength was. As he learned how to play his harp in a secret place with God. And I say that's the strength of the church. We need to get back to the altar.
The altar is a place of surrender. Surrender. That's where we get our orders. And I know you can have an altar in your in your heart. That's the most important. And I long for the day will come where we'll be able to have the freedom. Where we can kneel at the altar, stand at the altar. But until then, we're going to stand right where you're at. We're going to stand right where you're at. Make yourself an altar before the Lord. Make yourself an altar. If you're at home today, you're listening. Make yourself an altar. And it's right there where you're at. And so this song that we're going to sing talks about right now we're living. We feel pain. And we walk by faith. We're going to sing that. Let's sing that. And we'll, we'll pray. Yeah, let's stand.